That noose is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Their job is to save their job. Their job is not to save the public. In fact, it kind of all looks like a planned implosion to me. What's up, guys? I'm Nobody Special, and I have a special guest with us today. She is the Chief Market Analyst at ITM Trading. She's also been the keynote speaker at conferences and educational events all over the world, and you may know her also as the host of the ITM Trading channel on YouTube. I have got Lynette Zhang is with us today. Lynette, thank you so much for being here, and welcome. How are things with you? Well, things are very interesting, as you know, Jack, and I'm very happy to be here. Very happy to be part of this community and grow the community. I'm, I'm very happy to have you here. And uh, let, let's just dive right in. Let's talk about the AA rated elephant in the room, shall we? The yes. US credit rating was just downgraded last night. Fitch downgraded us from AAA to AA. This is the second downgrade in history. The first being in 2011, when S&P downgraded us the same way. You may recall 2011 was at a pretty eventful time for markets and for precious metals. So what is your take on this latest downgrade and what do you think this means for the economy? Wow. Well, you know, following on the heels of what happened over at the Bank of Japan, and also uh, you might have noticed that the Treasury is issuing a preliminary discussion on buying back some debt. So after the downgrade, they came out and said they're going to do 103 billion, which was in new debt, which was more than anybody had anticipated. And then they turn around and say that we're going to, we're looking at doing a bond buying program. It's kind of what happened at the Bank of Japan, right? When they were loosening their band, their interest rate band, and I personally think it's because they're losing control. And so better to make it look like we're remaining in control and widening that band. But then shockingly, interest rates went up. So then they announced the buyback, right? So they're they're loosening here and they're tightening here. And it, it, it's like they're schizophrenic. And we just did the same darn thing. We get downgraded, which means that interest rates go up and all the interest rates spiked from, you know, two years to 30 years and everything in between. And now we announced that we're maybe buying back, you know, we we're setting up a program to buy back our debt. So if they buy back the debt, that would be lower interest rate debt to roll it into higher interest rate debt. I mean, doesn't that seem like a little bit of a schizophrenic problem to you? <laughs> Yeah, and, and doesn't isn't that just the government's answer to every problem, it seems? Oh, we're just going to borrow more. Well, you just got your credit downgraded because you borrow too much. Uh, there they are. I was That's hoping we would get the money shooters. You got the money gun. <laughs> <laughs> We've got our first burr in channel history. Now, I, I share your sentiment on most issues in the market. And, you know, I always like to say on my channel, I'm something of a perma bear. I have to admit it. It's out in the open. I wear it here on my sleeve in invisible ink. I'm trying to find that silver lining out there. Sometimes I really have to squint to find it. Um, but you spend a lot of time in markets and doing research in the economy. Is there anything out there that you feel optimistic about that makes you think maybe there's reason for hope? Depends on what you're hoping for. I mean, I've studied currencies and currency life cycles since 1987. And I 100%, a bazillion percent know that the current iteration of this fiat money experiment, it actually died in 2008. So it's going away. And if you even look at the loss of purchasing power just since 2008, forget the fact that since the Fed's been in charge, it's 97% loss of purchasing power. Just since 2008, that has escalated just in the last year from all of this quantitative easing, which we're told is not going to create inflation and blah, 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 blah. I mean, lie, 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 let's lie some more. Because every single time they do that, the value of what's already out there goes down. It's easy to create that. But I do see a silver lining, so I do not see any way that uh, that that there's going to be a turnaround in the current circumstance because we are way too far gone. I mean, it's based on a 
constantly compounding the debt. And so when you see what's happening over, well, really, even Germany is the last AAA rated sovereign out there and they're in, in deep recession, right? So when you look at the central banks who admitted that they do not understand inflation, they certainly never admit that they created this problem. Their job is to regulate the rate and speed of it so that the public doesn't ask for more money. And I understand your question because one of the things that they knew when they created the system is that people marry the legal money of the state and they cannot help but think that it will regain some of its lost value. But here's a reality. It never does, period. It never does. You can look on the purchasing power chart and back when in at 20, between 29 and 33, it looks like the purchasing power went up. Just like in 2008, it looks like the purchasing power went up. Well, you probably weren't around in, in uh, 1933, but during the depression, do you ever recall anybody saying how great their purchasing power was during the depression? That would be a no. And you probably remember 2008. So, you know, do you notice that did it get so great during 2008? So really that part is a, an absolute lie. However, the bright spot and the opportunity is that since a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency, it is the central bank's job to, and, and Wall Street's job to suppress the visible price that you see because for some crazy reason, people actually believe the garbage that Wall Street puts out. I, I don't know why, you know, maybe because I worked there for so long and I know that it's garbage, but the opportunity, if you look at what the central bankers are doing for themselves, and when you look at what the ultra wealthy are doing for themselves, they're buying gold. And the reason why they're buying gold is because they 100% know how severely undervalued it is and that whoever holds their purchasing power, since this is a complete wealth transfer mechanism, whoever holds their purchasing power has the opportunity to have the wealth shift their way because wealth never disappears, just changes location. You sell a stock at, at 100 and it goes to 500 in, in nominal terms, that was your wealth transferring. They sell you a stock at 100 and it goes to zero, hmm, that's your wealth being transferred. So we have to recognize the true trend, which is the purchasing power trend. You, you can see that quite clearly. It's not coming back. It never has over 4,800 times. It's not happening now either. Now, you mentioned the purchasing power of fiat, and that's a great segue because one topic that I've seen all over the financial news cycle recently is this story of the seemingly imminent release of the new BRICS currency, more specifically a gold-backed BRICS currency. And I was watching the ITM channel on YouTube, and in one of your recent videos, like me, you expressed quite a bit of skepticism about whether this new BRICS currency will be gold back. And mm -hmm. in particular, you said, and I'm quoting here, unless you can convert any currency into the physical metal, then how do you know that it's really there? So do you consider the redeemability, is that really the key to a gold back currency? And if it wasn't redeemable, even if they call it gold backed, if it wasn't redeemable, is it really any different than all the fiat that we're using? Voila, exactly. I think that redeemability is everything because that's what always held a government, a central bank accountable because there are limits. If you can redeem it, then they have to hold at least a certain level there. Even in the fractional reserve system, there is a certain level of physical that they would have to hold. But if they don't, I mean, do you trust them? It's yeah, a, it, I mean it could potentially be another con game. I think the only people I trust less than my government would probably be the Chinese government or the Russian government, right? I mean, <laughs> or any government. Yeah, totally. In gold, in silver, we trust because you hold it and you own it. Yeah. And wasn't it JP Morgan's own quote, right? Gold is money, 
Everything else is credit. Yep. And that's a fact. And everything else is a contract. And they're changing the contracts right now to accommodate the Fed now. And they have them buried in such a deep place that unless you're a little ferret like I am, and you dig and dig and dig and dig and dig, you have no idea that anything has changed when in reality, everything has changed. That noose is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Speaking of that shrinking noose, you know, the U.S. banking system been making some headlines lately. Um, <laughs> you know, you did a video about stress in the banking system recently, and you touched on the topics of the bailout versus the bail in. And you spoke about how the FDIC and the Fed, they opted for the bailout back in March and more recently in May. Um, but that you also went on to suggest that the bail ins could could still be on the table. And, oh, and yeah. specifically, you said they're not ready for you to know the truth yet. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit on what that truth is and, and why the yet? What is going to what is it you think will bring the bail into the forefront here? Well, I think it goes back to what Janet Yellen said about, you know, they bailed them out. Of, don't call it a bailout. It was totally a bailout, but don't call it a bailout. <laughs> um, you know, but who got bailed out? It was Silicon Valley. It was the hedge funds. So it's still selective. And of course, when they talked about that, they talked about that being selective. So if it was a bank that was primarily for the public and not the elites, that's when it would be way too expensive to bail out. They didn't want you to know. And if they did a bail in, you would have known about it. Yeah. See, they can and for do those it in Cyprus, because that's so far away, people go, well, that's over there. But they're just not ready for us to realize that our wealth is being absolutely captured. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Cyprus. And, and for those who don't know, the chief difference between a bailout and a bail-in, a bailout, the public pays for it. The, the taxpayers, mm -hmm. the, the government prints or the FDIC bails them out. With a bail-in, the people who have the money in the bank pay for it. And that's what happened in Cyprus. Predominantly small business owners got mm -hmm. wiped out in Cyprus when they bailed in their banks. I think that was in 2015 or 2016. Um, and, you know, really with the bailouts in March, it was Silicon Valley. It was a lot of big tech startups. It was a lot of the ultra wealthy people who have a lot of sway in Washington that got bailed out when the law said they should have been bailed in. Right. I'm not sure it'll be the same for the small banks in, in flyover country. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, they will do this until it becomes too expensive. And when it becomes too expensive, it's because the primary entities are individuals, are the public. And even look at what happened, you know, from 2020 and all of that stimulus, they could not do what they did in 2008 by just bailing out the banks. So they gave some lots of money and did all sorts of stimulus to the public. But if you look at the level of stimulus and who really made out well, it wasn't the public. It was, again, the corporations that have been charging a ridiculous, they call it greedflation. But of course, that's not contributing to the inflation. It's not those lofty payouts to the CEOs, you know, at 3,000 times the average worker. That has nothing to do with it. It's the average worker asking for more money because the inflation has become obvious. And what's the Fed's job? Price stability. Now, if you don't know their language, you go, well, yeah, we want that glass to just remain the same price. That's not price stability. It is holding inflation at that 2% target rate because that is, they're still getting what they want, but it's happening so slow that you do not change your purchasing decisions or your wage decisions. That's price stability for the central banks. They just call it that because then if you hear it, you think, oh, well, yeah, they're trying to keep the prices stable. No. Yeah, stable is 2% inflation, which means the frog doesn't notice the water slowly boiling. Perfect. And the frog jumping out is the frog demanding a higher wage. And we had, uh, what was his name? Andrew Bailey, the head of the Bank of England recently, saying that, <laughs> oh, to fight inflation, 
people need to stop demanding raises. They just need to accept a lower standard of living that he, the central banker, had created. You, you The plebs, you just need to accept that. Just take the hit, right? Yeah. I, I mean, does anybody listen to what they say before they say it? I couldn't believe that they actually said that. That was incredible to me. The truth. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was finally a truth from the central bank, but it's just amazing that they actually admit it. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a rare moment of honesty. And, you know, it, maybe you want to run that one through a focus group next time before you, you take it to the public. I Just an idea. Just a thought. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk more about central bankers. As you're aware, the Federal Reserve basically controls the price of pretty much everything right now. And so predicting the Fed's move, their next move, it's important to any strategy, right? And now recently there's two distinct camps developing about what the Fed is gonna do. You've got the higher for longer camp, which says they've raised rates. Maybe they're almost done raising rates, but they're gonna stay there for a while. And there's people who think Jerome Powell's gonna kill the Fed put, that he's not gonna lower rates and ride to the rescue again. And then you've got the pivot camp who says, First rate cut might come as soon as this year, return to zero interest rate policy and eventually Fed go burr. So which camp does Lynette Zhang find herself in? Is it the higher for longer or the pivot? If you if you had to say which way they're going to go from here, where would you put it? I would put it as a pivot when there's enough angst in the markets. Then, yeah, their, their job is to save their job. Their job is not to save the public. Uh, but I also don't like to make any decisions on a short-term basis. I'm definitely a long-term strategist where I step back and I look at the patterns and what do the patterns tell me? The reality is, is we are in completely uncharted territory in our lifetime, but not historically, even recent history. So they don't know what to do Hence, all of the shifting right now, oh, we're going to issue all of this debt and we're, we might be buying it back and all of these changes. So, and, and part of this really is about credibility. And it was amazing to me, it was a year ago last June, when the central bank basically handed over the credibility to the markets and the markets knew they couldn't trust them anymore. And since then, they've just been doubling down. I mean, do the markets have any idea what the Fed is really going to do? Do the markets have any idea what the Bank of Japan is really going to do or the ECB or the Bank of England? No, no more forward guidance. A key tool that they used since 2008, jump. And the markets would say how high so they could get in position to benefit. They've taken that away. That means that we have entered extraordinarily dangerous territory. And I would also say, when talking about the forward guidance, if you will, from central bankers, let's remember the middle of 2021, peak transitory season, if you've been following inflation, when they were telling us, don't worry, inflation won't get that bad. The Fed had their dot plot, their summary of economic projections, where they predicted when they would start raising rates. And back when they were telling us inflation would be transitory, they told us no rate hikes until at least 2024. Here we are halfway through 2023, and we are at the tail end of the most aggressive tightening schedule the world has ever seen. So you have to take those Fed projections with something of a grain of salt, don't you? <laughs> I take everything. You know, my father always used to say to me, and it makes him sound less than, and to me he was like, the best man in the world. But he always used to say to me, do what I say, and not what I do. He was really referring to driving because he never looked behind him. He just, so he always had, he'd get in a car and boom. And I used to say to him, daddy, that just does not make sense to me. And I'll tell you, it's really interesting because that was a dance that we did my whole really teenage growing up years, but it really taught me to pay attention to what they're doing. I can, I listen to what they say, I read their reports, but then I watch what they do for themselves. And what are we seeing? We're seeing central bankers that have bought more gold and are continuing that trend of buying more gold than ever 
in history. Why? It's an old relic. Why? Because they want to stay in control. They want to stay in power and they want to maintain their choices. Same exact reason that individuals need the physical metal in their possession. So another thing that's happening these days and a story that's unwinding virtually before our eyes is the commercial real estate bubble. Yes. All right. So work from home is hurting offices and e-commerce has been hurting retail for years. And the losses are quite staggering in some of these numbers being thrown around with office buildings and malls and what they're selling for a lot because interest rates have risen now in unsustainable levels of debt. There's that common theme again. Mm -hmm. Now, they've been able to kick this can down the road for years, especially with the retail, mm -hmm. right? The transition to e-commerce is not a new phenomenon. That's a multi-decade long phenomenon. And yet yeah. these malls have been carried through and we've avoided the, de the defaults. Is there anything that you think the regulators can do or, or thinking several moves ahead? What are they likely to try to do to try to slow or dare I say even prevent the collapse of the commercial real estate bubble? You know, I don't know that they really want to actually postpone or prevent the collapse of the commercial real estate bubble. I think that we make the assumption that they want this party to keep going on, kick the can down the road, kick the can down the road. But what if they only wanted to kick the can down the road until they got the next iteration of the system in place? What if mm. they actually want a massive crisis so that they can introduce their CBDCs as the savior. So uh, I don't really think there's much that they can do. And when you look at, um, I think it was Starwood, and I think his name was, uh, is the head of Starwood. Barry Sternlich. Thank you. Yep. And what did he just say? That he's expecting a category five hurricane in commercial real estate. Well, and they have actually walked away from real estate recently, leaving the banks on the hook for it or the investors on the hook for it. So, you know, when you when you look at that, they keep talking about this soft landing or oh, maybe we'll avoid a recession. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's garbage. It's absolute garbage because of two key things. And nobody ever talks about this. But number one is there's no purchasing power left officially. There's no purchasing power left in this garbage. So you can't inflate it away. You got to go to negative rates and attack principle. Mm -hmm. Second of all, the key tool that they use to regulate the rate and speed of inflation are interest rates. And since they dropped it down to zero in even negative territory, that rate experiment didn't work, right? Every single time, every single time, zero exceptions, including here in the US, that they have attempted to raise rates so that they would have that tool again, they have been forced to drop them. So yes, I'm in the pivot camp because that's what history tells me is the most likely outcome. And I know they need a major crisis because people will go, save me, save me, save me. And if you're holding all your wealth in this, goes to zero, trillion times zero is zero. So I, I'm not personally convinced that this would be an accident. In fact, it kind of all looks like a planned implosion to me. And I'm talking about globally because I don't think it's, well, this is us and they're over there. I mean, everybody works at the IMF, right? 189 countries are all members of the IMF, treasury secretaries, central bank chiefs, nobody's elected. And, um, you know, they're all hanging out together, chatting. Do you think they don't talk about any of this stuff? Man, you know, you, you mentioned Sternlicht and Starwood walking away from the buildings. And a lot of people say, oh, that doesn't affect me. I don't care what some rich guy does with his giant building. And most people don't realize the debt against most of these buildings is living in their pension fund. You know, yes. one of the favorite places these outfits love to dump their CMBS, this toxic debt, is into a teacher's pension fund. 
They wine and dine the fund managers, and it's not even their money, so they don't care. Sure, this guy showed me a good time. Here's a billion dollars of somebody else's money. Yep. Well, when these billionaires walk away from these buildings, the billionaires make out like bandits. They just hand the keys back, and they're out of debt. They're, they're scot-free. It's the pensioner who takes the hit. And I've been saying on my channel for a long time, even when inflation, you know, when CPI was 9% last year, I was saying they will turn the money printers back on. And the reason they'll do it is because we beg them to. And right. watch how fast that begging starts when the pensions start going belly up. And all the way at the top of Exter's pyramid is unfunded liabilities. That's your pensions. And if they don't print, they'll default on those pensions by letting them go belly up as all the debt defaults. But if they do print, they'll also default on that obligation by giving you the dollar amount of the money that they owe, but the printing will deflate away the spending power of that money. So either way, the average person, they're going to socialize these losses. And, you know, that's why I always keep this stuff handy. You have to, you have to hang on to some of that. That is at the very base of Exter's pyramid is physical metal in your possession. Yes. And, and I'm really glad that you brought that up because I should have brought it up. But yeah, I mean, this is this is risk transfer. And I mean, when you look at the whole system, it's really genius. It's evil genius, but it's absolutely genius because you're paying somebody to sell you risk. Yep. <laughs> and then you continue to pay them all the time to sell you risk. So, you know, yeah, they get away scot-free. They've made their money. They don't care. And guess what? If too many people ask for that money back, they just go, nope. Because if you don't hold it, you don't own it. But in addition to, you know, gold and silver, that's your wealth protection. That, that is your insurance. That also puts you in a position to take advantage of what's happening. But we need more than that, too. Uh, I was never much of a farmer or gardener. That was not my thing. But I became one because I know that food becomes the single biggest issue for people during this. So I so strongly believe that we all need to be as independent and self-sufficient as possible. If you have gold and silver, and silver for me is about barterability. So if you have silver, Yes, you're going to be able to buy your food. You're going to be able to buy your gasoline. But anything physical is really barterable. So I have my mantra that I personally execute for myself. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Because these are all the things that we need to sustain a reasonable standard of living. We all remember what happened to the grocery store shelves in 2020, yeah. right? Well, has that been really fixed? If you look at behind that first row that you see when you go to the grocery store, it's empty. It's empty. So we need to make sure that we have all of our bases covered. I mean, that's just, to me, that's just critical. So speaking of the shelves and the stores and, and retail spending, we've got one last elephant in the room, and that is the recent Supreme Court decision striking down President Biden's student loan forgiveness. So coming up, I believe it's October is when the first payments are due. Mm -hmm. One in 10 Americans, one in 10 adults will have a $400 a month student loan payment coming back. And a lot of people don't realize the reason maybe they haven't felt all of that pain from inflation over these last few years is because they somebody hit the pause button on their yep. debt payments. Yep. Well, the inflation is still here and the debt payment is coming back. So what do you think this looks like come October when these payments start up again? How does the market react? Is there any one sector you think might be particularly vulnerable or exposed to this? And where do we go from there? Well, I think uh, the auto sector is likely to be really impacted by this, but I think retail as well because these people over the last three years, well, some of them used to pay down that, their debt, and that was good because it raised their credit scores so they could take on even more debt. And that's what people typically do, right? They live, they live up to and beyond their standard of living. So having to now make those payments again is going to be extraordinarily painful 
and the repercussions will go throughout the economy to wherever they were spending their money, whether it's eating out or it's those car loans. And we're seeing a lot more of the, the credit ratings are going back to where they were, right? So we're seeing a lot more defaults that are rising in that sector, in that area, and it's gonna get worse. And when you couple that with the fact that most people can't come up with 500 bucks in an emergency, and now all of these student loans that were on pause coming back in at $400 a month, this is going to be really painful. Soft landing, schmoff landing, not going to happen. It's going to be hard. And it's going to be, I believe, we're headed for a hyperinflationary depression. Yeah, you know, I, I, I share your sentiment. I think auto comes to mind right away, especially some of these numbers just blow me away. The average auto car payment right now is somewhere around $750 a month. $1,000 a month car payments are commonplace, especially among younger borrowers who are less economically secure. I mean, just staggering numbers. And, you know, you're already starting to see it with the banks are tightening their lending standards, record rejections for auto loans applications. Um, so autos definitely, I think, comes to mind. And you're right, the whole retail sector, I mean, that's going to come out of discretionary spending elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. No choice about that. I mean, you know, you can stretch yourself so far. And if you look at the credit cards, I mean, a lot of people have been in these these uh, programs where you can go to the grocery store and borrow the money and divide it up into four equal payments to buy groceries. People have been forced to take on debt to buy food. That's scary. Yeah. That is really, really scary for those people. Really, really scary. Well, Lynette, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Once again, folks, Lynette Zhang, Chief Analyst at ITM Trading and the host of the ITM Trading YouTube channel. I'll put a link down in the description below to that. Definitely subscribe to that channel. Great stuff over there. And of course, tell them that nobody sent you. And Lynette, I'll give you the final word. Anything you want to say on the way out? Well, um, I would like to say that one of the things that make us different than anybody else is that I've been studying currencies and currency life cycles and those patterns since 1987. And I developed a strategy for myself, which we've made even better and execute for all of our clients. You got to have a plan. And this is based on what happens 100% of the time. So I can't guarantee tomorrow, but I really do believe that if something's happened over 4,800 times, 100% of the time, and we're doing the same thing, what's the best shot? This time's gonna be different because that's what they want you to believe so you stay vulnerable. I don't believe that. I think we're going to get the same or similar results. So the strategy is based upon those repeatable patterns and being in the right place at the right time with the right asset so that you can sustain your standard of living and even come out on the other side of this better. And we have the Beyond Gold and Silver channel as well. So we meet you where you are because we take a very, very holistic approach on how we take care of our clients and our, and our viewers because you need to know everything. You, you need to be as prepared as possible. And, and this that you and I are doing right now, for me, this is about building community, which is arguably the single most important thing because one person cannot do it all. Outstanding stuff. Thank you very much, Lynette, for joining us today and for sharing your insight with us. Once again, folks, that is Lynette Zhang from the ITM Trading. Uh, she Her channel is down below. There is a link to that, so check that one out. And until next time, live small and dream big.